The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Steve Lord, uh, who is also here at Caltech uh, down at IPAC. Uh, he uh, has worked for, as a support scientist uh, for many infrared missions over the years, including uh, the KAO, uh, IRAS, ISO, Spitzer, Herschel, and SOFIA. Uh, and he's part of a rare breed of astronomer who has actually done science from the stratosphere, flying on both KAO and uh, SOFIA. Uh, additionally, and uh, one of the uh, main uh, areas of expertise and why we invited him here is uh, he wrote the ATRAN program, which is in common... Uh, sorry, I'm having, where is your presentation, Steve? Uh, it's in a folder. It's in a different folder. Okay, maybe Sarah can help. Uh, so, uh, as, as I said, Steve wrote the ATRAN uh, Atmospheric Transmission uh, Program, which uh, is in common use at uh, many observatories. And uh, Steve is going to tell us about uh, the yes. uh, limitations of the atmosphere and uh, advantages, again, of airships. There we go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the last two presentations, and especially Jen, Jen's comment, thank you, that um, the transmission from Sophia is okay. There's a lot, um, a lot uh, encompassed in that okay. Uh, I, uh, I just have to show one slide for 10 seconds, and this was yesterday, uh, the uh, goodbye Herschel day. Uh, this is uh, 6 a.m., uh, the thermal... Uh, rise uh, at a specific time uh, where the helium started boiling off, so it, it was a grand mission. Um, the, uh, I, as, as Lynn said, I've modeled the atmosphere uh, using uh, a, a program I wrote uh, called ATRAN, Atmospheric Transmission. And uh, I'm not, uh, by training, an atmospheric scientist, but I have a little bit of uh, experience with this, and one of the things I've noted over the two decades that ATRAN has been in operation, that there are only about four such programs that are used in astronomical observatories that do this. Uh, there's a very nice review by uh, Juan and Stutsky uh, in 2012, I recommend. And they, they have similar problems where they disagree in areas uh, to model uh, transmission, which has to do the wet and dry continuum and and how far out you take line wings and things. But for the purpose of this particular workshop and, and uh, lecture day, the, the, that, that's not terribly relevant. Uh, the same results would obtain with any of these uh, software uh, programs. And just to orient you again, no, I need a, is this a pointer here? Okay. We're, we're talking, uh, in this workshop, we're concerned with Sophia altitudes and up to about 100,000, or maybe we're limited to 65,000 feet when we talk just about airships, but when we compare with uh, long-duration balloons, it's, we're, we're, doing, uh, we're trying to understand why this niche of airships is important and, and preferential in some cases. And that uh, involves, as Jen has said, the uh, convenience factor of... Uh, of of the uh, airship and the cost factors, but it w often gets right back down to the atmospheric factors. And I will show models, and this is not um, going to be your most exciting talk because I'm going to go through the <coughs> windows from the near infrared, the mid infrared, the thermal infrared, on to the far infrared and the sub millimeter. I'm going to walk through them and compare what an airship, what a uh, ground base, best ground base observatory can do. And finally, what uh, a high altitude balloon can do. I, I show a slide because uh, I was the the workshop started already. We had a, a wiki and we started comparing notes. and uh, And Elliot Young uh, asked me if I'd considered emission, and I thought, well, I should probably talk about that for a second because it's important. Uh, there's uh, radiation, as as Jen said, when he was talking about observing during the daytime, that that comes downward from the atmosphere, as well as the atmosphere blocking transmission. This is just a view of, uh, you see uh, the corresponding emission 
from where there's transmission in those there's there's transmission going from zero to one here all the plots you'll see in my talk are like that and so you see holes uh, where there's no transmission meaning there's uh, em there's a blockage of atmospheric uh, molecules and this is the emission the downwelling radiance it's a nice term and uh, what this does and I, I'm just going to talk about it now and not further in the talk is it makes your uh, background limited detectors uh, less <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a higher background in these uh, downwelling regimes, so your, your observations are less efficient, not only because your transmission is worse, in other words, closer to zero, but you're also getting emission, which, uh, which makes your NEP not a, as effective. So uh, Jen showed this slide, but it's, I want to dwell on it just a, a minute longer than he did um, and say that this is interesting in the sense that water vapor... Is, uh, has a higher layer as you get to the equatorial latitudes. And people who have done, done airborne astronomy at the equator, at, even at uh, 42,000 feet, have noticed some days it rains on their airplane. Uh, and uh, there is airship altitude where you're safely above the tropopause. And what governs the, these profiles are three distributions, essentially. The water vapor dominates, and that freezes out at the tropopause at about 14, kilom 14 kilometers. And the ozone uh, has its effect. It's a separate population. And it's, as, as uh, the first speaker says, way up here, but, um, and goes quite up to 30 kilometers. And you can't do much about that unless you have a satellite. Uh, but the uh, mixed gases uh, contribute a lot of uh, annoying lines, but for the most part, it's the water vapor that dominates your uh, transmission, and uh, you you must try to get above it. And the higher you get above it, the better you'll do, as you'll see in the next slides. And I'm just uh, again, this is another slide that Jen showed, and I just since my topic was the advantages of going up in the atmosphere, I, I did include it as well. And again, we're we're talking in this regime here where the coherence length uh, and the um, isoplanetic patch are, uh, increase and give you that uh, advantage. But I think this will be come up in the workshop. But I think m more than the seeing, per se, is the transmission. So I'm going to walk you three, through. Uh, there's a three here. It should be a four. Four uh, observatories, one, uh, two real and two hypothetical. Uh, and, and just walk through the atmosphere in seven slides from uh, the near-infrared, uh, again, through the mid-infrared, thermal-infrared, far-infrared, and the continuum. And th the way I do it is uh, with a, a smoothing uh, of, uh, I go in these steps from uh, less than a micron to three micron smoothing by, uh, in a, uh, with a resolution element of 0.05, and I lower the resolution element, sorry, raise the resolution element as I go along because uh, the spectral lines are, uh, of a, uh, to get, the way to say this is uh, the lines that you'll see uh, if I go back up to, it's sort of like saying uh, what is the transmission here is sort of like asking what is the length of a coastline. Uh, as you go to, to finer and finer resolution, there are lines and lines and lines. So if you use any resolution element, you end up blending the lines. And it's usually about 0.02 or 0.01 uh, wave numbers uh, it, the, in other words, the line minimum wavelength for our atmosphere somewhat constant in frequency or wave number proportional. Uh, and so you'll see that I, I vary the wavelength resolution in the following plots to match that. Uh, so let's go marching forward. And you start in the near infrared. And now there's, there's, as I said, four observatories here. I chose Apex, you could say ALMA. And a very good night up there is a half a micron of precipitable water overhead. And that's going to be your blue uh, porous transmission because we're going up in the atmosphere to Sophia altitudes. There's your yellow. And you can see that the uh, transmission blockage is narrower. And this is the, the, the hallmark of water lines. Again, they are uh, the lower atmosphere lines and they are uh, uh, narrower as you go up in high, to higher and higher altitude. And, and if finally, you see the, the, the green here, or the cyan, I think it's more uh, appropriate to say, and the balloon as uh, magenta, you see that you, you gain factors of several in the transmission. 
And that translates as a square when you're talking about integration time to achieve the same signal to noise. Um, so when you look at these plots, there are only seven of them, uh, try, to, um, try to square this number and see how poorly you're doing, say, with a, uh, an aircraft at 41,000 feet, coincidentally, or an airship at 65,000 feet, etc. cetera. And, and we're going to march along. Uh, you, you, by the way, you went through the uh, J, K, uh, L, and M bands here. They're the top bands where these come up um, for your microwave, uh, uh, for your near infrared observations. And you see uh, large uh, holes in the atmosphere. And again, these are, these are average of many deeper lines, and they smooth out. So I've tried to make this visually uh, accept, acceptable without losing um, the general feeling of what, uh, the, how complex it is. And, um, and you see, uh, again, about a factor of two to four going from the ground base at, uh, uh, say, uh, Alma altitudes to uh, Sophia. And then you gain another factor of two going to the airship at uh, 65,000 feet. And that's directly because of the water vapor the uh, mixed gases, which are approximately seven other gases in the atmosphere, uh, they, they, they are not uh, conquerable by going uh, up in altitude like the water vapor is. And um, you'll notice now that what we did is we passed through uh, very interesting uh, wavelengths where, uh, where most, uh, uh, say, um, galaxy have their peak admission between 16 and 100 microns. So these are very important wavelengths. And people uh, have been courageous trying to get them from the ground. And you notice that at the mountaintops, uh, you, you, you do see some, uh, some little blips. And in fact, they, they're, uh, I, I'm going the wrong way here. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, you get, you get uh, another. These, this is the South Pole folks. And um, uh, the, the high uh, site of Alma have managed to get the 205 and a couple uh, or one uh, uh, transition of carbon monoxide. But this is, again, uh, not efficient uh, in some of the graphs that you've seen before. Uh, and so uh, I want to try to draw your eye to these, these comparisons of factors of three and four between Sophia and an airship. And this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about getting up to 65,000 feet. We're gaining a factor of three in transmission, so we're gaining a factor of nine in integration time. And if we're saving money at the same time, there's a lot of sense there. Okay, we're almost uh, to the sub-millimeter. And um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going down again the wrong way. I, I switched the scale to, to gigahertz at this point uh, for just convenience, so we're going from 150 to 300 microns, if that's more happy for you. And um, and then uh, we're coming out to, this, to, the, to one millimeter here. We're going from uh, uh, 300 microns to a millimeter in transmission. And this is the interesting part. This is that now you're getting to the ground-based submillimeter observatories, and they fight this stuff. And there's an oxygen line that's extremely important in here. But again, you're, you're past most of this in space and in the high altitude. Um, so I tried to do three cases to bring this to reality, and that is atomic fine structure lines that we use for different purposes, and then I'm going to talk about uh, molecular lines, and I'm going to talk about continuum. Um, and I'll probably finish early, actually. So uh, I, I chose a sample of lines, and these are ones that have been real life adventures for me uh, up in the stratosphere and the in, in, in airborne observatories and for my colleagues. And this is why I've been involved in this uh, sort of work. Uh, and I'll start with a topic of science, which is H2 regions or planetary nebulae. And they're a very effective, the, the, the wonderful fact of these particular uh, fine structure lines, the, a pair of sulfur three lines, iron uh, a series, uh, uh, oxygen three, 52 and 88 microns, nitrogen 3, which couples with other nitrogen lines, is they tell you a tremendous amount about what's going on in an H2 region without having the problem of extinction, uh, which almost all optical lines suffer from tremendously. It's a plot by Bob Rubin uh, and shows pairs of uh, lines. 
And what you have going on on the x-axis is density, and what you have going on on the y-axis is your measurable quantity, the ratio of two of these lines. And the reason all these plots have the same shape is that one of the pair has a different critical density than the other. So for a time, one of the lines uh, is a, a has an emission proportional to n squared, while the other is an emission proportional to n. And then they both are either n squared or n. So that's a very common plot in diagnostic. And you can see that it's very temperature independent. These very good diagnostics of densities of planetary nebula H2 regions are used for supernovae as well. And so I'm just going to talk about some of these lines. And now you can see what's going on. And this, the program I have actually um, gives you what's causing the problem here. I take the dozen or 40, uh, bright, up to 40 uh, lines with the biggest equivalent width, and I give you a little code on the bottom as, as what they are. So you get a feeling of what's causing the difficulty. Now here, you're pretty well off at a ground-based observatory observing the 18 micron sulfur-3 line. But, and, and so, uh, you know, you, that's not an advantage going to an airship. But then when you go to the, its pair, pairing the other uh, sulfur-3 line, you've got real problems at ground base. And I put uh, zero as the transition of the line in velocity because I do a lot of galaxy work. And so you're really interested in the local galaxies as well. And you, this then becomes this forest of lines that we were talking about before becomes extremely um, debilitating if you have a survey of galaxies. So this is not a big debilitation, but you can see uh, a factor of, uh, of uh, 30 percent between Sophia and an airship, and then with a high altitude balloon you gain again. So I'm going to uh, walk through a few more of these. Iron II, uh, we've, we've used for probing supernova. Uh, uh, new material produced by supernova, but we would never be able to do that from the ground. Um, and uh, again, these are water vapor uh, large absorption features. And I'm going forward again with a, another um, iron line, and you can see at zero velocity, you're, you're uh, not in much good shape. So you might wonder what's happening at 3,000 kilometers per second with supernova 1987A. Uh, and going forward again, uh, I, I'm looking at now uh, a neon three line. The neon series has been used in comparison with an oxygen series to great advantage um, probing uh, AGN, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, so you get a I get a feeling. I'm, I'm hoping you're getting a feeling right here. You're you're out of luck at uh, ground based at 30 microns. You're past the mid infrared. You're you're into the far infrared, and um, but you do have a, a, a quite an advantage. If you're at, uh, if say, if you're looking at say galaxies in this regime, uh, you you have a lot of trouble even calibrating uh, something like this because it's very water vapor dependent. Which if you're um, if you're below the um, tropopause or you're even in the tropopause, can vary tremendously. Uh, it, you can you, the overhead precipitable microns can vary from uh, from from ten to one, and and you. You're up and down the slope of the, uh, um, with uh, Sophia, for example, you're up and down the slope uh, where, where you're depending on a radiometer that might be looking straight up in the airplane, whereas your object is, is at an a, a, a elevation angle of 30 degrees or 40 degrees. This one, uh, again, you're above the water vapor with all, all the, um, with the oxygen three line at 52 microns, you're above the water vapor with all these. Uh, particular uh, 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 stratospheric observatories or uh, high altitude observatories. So this is a very nice pair, and it's used to great advantage, very strong uh, transition. And uh, nit uh, nitrogen-3 is quite useful in comparison with other nitrogen transitions to get stellar effective temperatures. But you see, again, this problem. When, when we, each time you go higher up, you get a narrower uh, line and a much more reasonable uh, 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 basis of observation. Um, now I'm going to switch to. I think I skipped. Now yeah, I'm going to switch to another type of uh, science that's done quite a bit nowadays: uh, photo association region diagnostics. And this has been a very successful field in the last 15 years, uh, with every satellite observatory and the airborne observatories uh, to use uh, these these two lines. 
oxygen one and carbon two are the primary coolants of the interstellar media, and uh, they are, out, uh, are more efficient than CO often. And they, the, their ratio and their combination in relation to far infrared flux in the photo association region uh, models has been very successful in understanding the, coal, uh, the warm neutral medium around molecular clouds. So this science has basically informed us of a, of a whole uh, uh, part of the interstellar medium, one of the components of the interstellar medium, the warm neutral medium. And again, um, ground base is not much help for, uh, say, the silicon uh, uh, two line, although, although people in the Antarctic, Gordon, Stacy, et cetera, have map, mapped it down there. Um, Dome, uh, Dome A might be doing this research in the future. Uh, the, um, the oxygen one line is, is, is terribly difficult even from uh, Sophia, as you can see, and getting up to higher altitude would be uh, much, much easier for galactic uh, velocities. Uh, and then as you walk along in, um, in, in uh, redshift, you, uh, you do encounter problems at every altitude. You, you, that's why a lot of the great surveys now have been done with $2 billion, $3 billion uh, space telescopes, which we are running out of. Um, and I, I just took this to a higher velocity to let you know that that's where people are going. They're exploring the high Z universe. And uh, the, the, you, you don't run out of trouble. Uh, this, you're walking across in transmission, and you're finding uh, new uh, oxygen lines. And you can see this is almost all oxygen. There's some O2 absorption, but they're mostly oxygen problems. That's why getting above 40,000 feet is the key. Um, this is the other oxygen line, which isn't so afflicted. Uh, and they, as a pair, are a great density measure. And now carbon-2 is the, uh, the uh, next best thing since CO. And uh, it is, uh, it's got a fairly uh, tractable uh, transmission over high Z, although, you know, um, I forget if it's this one or this one is exactly where ARP-220 is uh, from, from uh, Sophia and from uh, other platforms. But uh, then uh, I did take it out to longer uh, wavelengths again, because that's where people are going to observe C plus or carbon-2 for their modeling. And you run into uh, a lot of different lines as you go out. So these are the practical problems that even uh, an airship will have doing um, uh, what uh, is one area of science. And I'm not trying to say that my, my slide shows a complete set of types of science, the astronomy that you can do from the altitude. Another pair of lines that are becoming very interesting, they've been detected at high Z from ALMA, are the nitrogen-2 pair, the nitrogen-205 micron. I mentioned that had been detected from Antarctica in a couple places. That's a very unusual uh, detection. It's also uh, the high-altitude site. The longest wavelength far infrared light is, line has been detected from the highest altitude site on Earth. And, uh, but th this is, shows you the, uh, a new paper out by Zhao that uh, shows there's a very strong correlation between uh, nitrogen-2 emission and, and infrared luminosity. And it might be an easy way at high redshift to get infrared luminosities. And this is, but it's problematical, the 122 micron line from, uh, at zero velocity, uh, even from Sophia. So getting, here's a big airship advantage, getting up there is great. Uh, the 205 micron doesn't suffer that problem, but you still need to get up to a high altitude. Um, a, a last one, and I, after I pulled the slide out, I realized I pulled out an ISO slide, not a Herschel slide. But uh, the, it just shows you, you can, uh, the space observatories have been doing this line, uh, oxygen-426 micron. And it becomes a great discriminator between Aegean and star-forming uh, uh, region uh, galaxies, especially when it's used in conjunction with a uh, a more conventional star formation line like NEON2 and, and PA, PA emission. So this, this is, again, this line shows you uh, the problems from the ground are solved uh, for many wavelengths from altitude. Um, now, I wanted to switch gears from all these atomic lines to molecular lines, and I found nothing more exciting than the um, KL observations that Ted Bergen has done with the Hexos group with Herschel. And he's basically plowing through a forest 
of emission lines, dozens of species and hundreds of transitions. And I think I'm underestimating both those numbers. And we're discovering the, the basic composition of Orion. And we're doing it um, with uh, uh, radiative transfer modeling, pulling all these lines out of, we call them uh, lines out of the weeds, interesting lines out of the weeds. And, um, and what happens when, if you were to try to do surveys like this from Sophia or airships, so I, I walked, what I did is I took these two surveys. That, now, these are in gigahertz, but you'll see the, the microns in a second if you're more comfortable. And, uh, and I took them down into different altitudes to, take, to show you what the transmission is. And here's the output of my transmission program. And here's the uh, 5, 577 micron program, or 520 gigahertz. And you just can't do anything from 20,000 feet. I started at 20,000 feet. And then I walked up to 40. And now you're doing OK. So there's, there, you're not even above the tropopause, and you're really going to get good science, but you have a, a heck of a time sorting out the transmission absorption from the lines. And likewise, when you get up higher, somehow the lines get narrower. I mean, they, the lines naturally get narrower, so you have a little bit of competition between uh, narrow lines. And uh, finally, I went up to 95,000 feet, and things are flattening out. And I'm going to speed up just a little. OK, well, I have a movie to show you. And I have, it's, each movie is one minute long, so I think I can get it in. That's, those are my last two things. OK, this, this just gives you the feeling. This is uh, two PAX bands and a Spire band, and it's a quadrant of the galaxy done with the high gauss survey of the entire disk. And you can see star-forming regions, and you can see bubbles, and you can see filaments where uh, star formation seems to be located, this is sort of a, one of the major discoveries of Herschel, is the, the regions in which stars are formed. And what I did for fun is I walked this down to 20, these three filters down to 20 uh, kilometers, and I redid the movie uh, to see what, uh, if you had a two and a half meter telescope at 20 kilometers, which I don't think you do, uh, what you would get. And um, again, I've got this problem. One second. Yeah, here we are. So it basically wipes out the two short wavelength bands. And you get a murky. But if you had a, a, a big telescope at 20,000 feet, this is what it taught me. You would see a lot of the structure in the 350 micron um, uh, band of, of spire. So I've shown you three different examples of real astronomy, taking it down to altitude and back up. And uh, you can see that. I think the last speaker said, or, or no, I think Mike said, the advantages, the more you study them, the advantages are complex of going to different altitudes. So that, that's the best I can conclude. So thank you. <laughs>